WBFY Belfast Community Radio presents Help Thyself, a show about health and well-being. The information and opinions expressed by the guests or host of Help Thyself do not necessarily reflect the views of WBFY Community Radio or its license holder, the City of Belfast, or should be taken as medical advice or a health provider-patient relationship. And today our special guest is Kim Snyder Steer Steers. Yes. Sorry, I almost pronounced that incorrectly. Most of people do. <laughs> Heart Centered Connection, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm, it's a privilege, an honor. I'm really humbled to be here. Great. It's so good. Well, I'm really excited about having the opportunity to uh, have our listeners uh, get to know a little bit more about you. So maybe you could start off about telling us a little bit about yourself. Myself personally. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to separate that anymore from what I practice. It's really interesting. It's been changing over the last few years. Um, personally and professionally, it's it's like this path has become my whole life. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So maybe really if we start at the beginning then. Okay. Let's try <laughs> to like go back in time and maybe talk about how you got started on this whole journey and how yeah. you know you came to doing the work that you do and mm -hmm. and that type of thing. So I would say that as far back as I can remember I have had this ability, sensibility about me to feel what other people feel a lot. Like just in the family system having um, compassion and empathy I guess that might be the best way to say it, to be able to feel other people close to me. And sometimes I got a little mixed up in that. And so as I got a little farther away from my biological family and started to read more about energy and about heart-centeredness, I started to make a connection that I do have a really beautifully open heart. And that was really part of what I wanted in my life was to stay open-hearted. Mm -hmm. And I was very much drawn to other people who are heart center based and that's how my the name eventually came from my practice right. my husband helped me with that Larry um, around how, what would we call my practice and I call we call it a practice because it, I can't do a business it doesn't like what I do is really from my heart center and it's really a way to now to serve um, the people I love and the community I love and then it ripples from there so early on, um, I became interested in metaphysics. I think that was it, mostly. So it was energy, my connection to, um, to feelings and thoughts and heart-based practices. And through that early beginning, I started to be drawn to hospice work. Gotcha. And hospice work led me to then want to work deeper with the people who were dying and then people who were bereaved. And in working with the dying is when I met the first meditation teachers that I would have, which was through Naropa University and Rigpa Spiritual Care. And that was the Tibetan Buddhist group who helped me to understand more about what meditation was and the benefits of being still. And did you find that um, really transformational for yourself? Was that... Uh, mm -hmm part of your self-growth did that you know yeah. um, it was it, it I use that in my I was 11 years ago when I took that training I had become our hosp our local um, hospice and home health they had asked me to become their spiritual care coordinator they were missing a chaplain at that time and so I didn't have a chaplain background but I said yes to being spiritual care coordinator I guess Mimi saw something in me that she resonated with in terms of you know the way in which I did my one-on-one um, uh, -on -one working with people who were dying who were in that stage of their death and dying and I decided at that moment that what we, I was getting here was wonderful but I needed something more and I was drawn instantly to Naropa to a program called um, contemplative end-of-life spiritual care and that was with the Tibetan Buddhist Rigpa spiritual care and Naropa and I recognize now that every single day <laughs> I use that pra those practices, what I've learned there, which was mindfulness, being and witnessing and being very attentive and allowing mm -hmm. um, people to have where they, be where they were, which may be in grief, it might be in sadness, it might be in fear, and I was learning to listen from a new place. 
a deeper place in my heart center. Mm. This is where it resonates for me. More than in the you know in the brain, I really just drop things down into the heart, yeah. and I hear from that place. That sounds um, like you're really opening yourself to people. That does it really get um, <laughs> hard sometimes? I mean, <laughs> it, it's not a thing that anybody really wants to have to go through, um, but it is a fact of life. And how do you protect yourself and still be available? I mean. Hmm, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I get asked that a lot. I see a lot of people here in Belfast, and I, you know, from new in utero babies to you know children to um, teens, young adults, elders, and in the scope of the whole heart-centered practice that I have, um, I work with a lot of people, and I could get very energetically drained if I wasn't taking really good care of myself. And there are moments when I haven't. And so I've been very energetically drained or very emotionally drained. So what I've come to understand is that I'm learning. I'm always learning. And I'm always open to learning. I'm always teachable. So when I feel, now I understand, when I'm feeling like I haven't filled my own cup up to the overflowing, then I'm probably not going to have much to give. <laughs> and if I give, it's probably going to be from a place of lack. So that's what I often teach. And I teach a lot of mothers and some fathers, and that's one of the biggest tools, is fill our own cups first, and then what do we have and what's overflowing is what everybody can eat or drink from. Mm -hmm. And that, that serves me. It serves me every day to do that. So that's been a practice of mine that's been evolving. I didn't do it all the time. And it wasn't always available to me. I didn't always know it at each level. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, uh, it makes sense, but it doesn't sound necessarily easy. Ah, right. Well, there's certain tools that I would use, and I do use every single day. Mm -hmm. Every single day. And those have evolved as well. When I used to think that it was simply sitting for 20 minutes twice a day, sometimes it didn't seem very doable. But I learned that it is. Mm -hmm. And I also gave myself permission to be flexible, but not rigid. So not being, you know, in my spiritual practice, not actually punishing myself when I didn't do it what I would might think is a perfect, you know, a perfect way. Meaning I didn't, I'm not, I'm not in an ashram. I'm not sitting on a mountain and I'm not a monk. I'm a householder. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what I, and I love bringing this practice into the very, very comfortable atmosphere um, of my life. And that's what I'm trying to um, help people with who come to see me and in this community when we meet in groups or classes. And I'll say that one, I want to just give a shout out to one of my teachers. Um, I have a couple of them, but one in particular is David G. And David G. Um, wrote a couple of books, um, but what I learned from him in taking his course on becoming a meditation teacher, which I didn't think I could do, but he basically just shined the light back on me and said, yeah, I actually can. Um, and that comfort is queen and that can make this process really accessible to people. And that I took that away and I ran with that. So if I can practice it every day, I can imagine everyone can because I'm a procrastinator. I don't want to do what I don't want to do. I have a really great rebel in me. Um, and I don't like discipline at all. I mean, I'm not a disciplined person, so this is, you know, this has been a, an exploration in my own life that I actually do have these tools that help my mind, body, and spirit, and my health and well-being to be the better part of who I want to be. Yeah, yeah, great. I think that's really hard for, especially in modern times, um, you know, everything seems to be so fast-paced and everybody's pushing so hard to compete with everybody and yeah. then they beat themselves up yes <laughs> for not being able to meet not just somebody else's expectations but their own expectations yeah and so, yeah, that's that's a biggie yeah um, so self-compassion is one of the the basis of my practice um and when i say my practice is you know i just teach where i'm at where in the moment when people come to my group, they'll, they'll come into their groups, kind of in our group. I have a, been having a meditation group every Thursday morning for the last three or four years now. And before that, it was nighttime group, and it was women only, and now it's still women, but now there were men's groups last year. And what I found was um, just show up. 
uh -huh. actually just just be here in this okay. moment and and we actually learn together how to be more um, self compassionate so as people come to the practice I, it's more like I'm reading what it is that they need and so we'll sit together and it's not what I want to teach though I might have some notes there what's really showing up is what do they need and they're coming forward with their need mostly it's stress reduction right now it's just about help my brain to calm, show me how to calm my own brain so that I can be healthier. My, my body can be, my immune system can be, you know, back in check or, you know, come back alive. Um, and how relationships help me, you know, with my relationship, and I go with myself first and then move my relationship into the ripple effect of who's around me. If that makes sense. Oh, it definitely makes sense. Yeah. I ask yeah. this question a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, and I and I think for people, it's hard to wrap their minds around that because we're in that kind of ideology that we have to give to everyone else, and it makes us a good person by right. being there for everybody and right. giving to them and and what have you, yeah. and um, then they get sick or depleted, and, yeah. and they, you know, without having that ability to do that, they're kind of lost. So one of the things um, that I've learned, and this is this this took personal. This is why I person I you know I sit on my cushion every day, and my cushion might be the back of my you know sitting up against my bed when I first wake up in the morning. It could be a chair in my room. I usually find a beautiful spot that I love, and I sit. I just simply sit, and then I close my eyes. I do things that are incredibly useful, so that I start to understand that I come. I have to come first. And I don't mean that, and, and I, I used to think that was really selfish, and I think that that's part of the energy that we're shifting out of. In fact, I know that it's the energy that we're shifting out of. That if I fill up my cup, or if I do this for me first, you know, I won't have any energy left to give anyone else, or I will not have any more time. And that was something that I'm, I'm learning and have learned greatly as a myth, is that it, number one, it takes a lot of time to do self-care. It doesn't. It's actually more of an intention, and even in the intention, there's so much more to give. And I do understand this new um, energetic about myself and others, and I'm getting a lot of beautiful feedback that what people are experiencing is that when they have taken the time for some sort of self-care, some practice, that they, it may not be meditation or um, it may not be EFT tapping, which I love, which is a daily practice for me. It might be that they need to run, or they need to go to the gym, or they need to, you know, dance, or they need to do artwork. Mm -hmm. And all of those things can be done from a new place of mindfulness. So that I, there's there's the mindful categories: being aware that I'm actually in the day, being aware that I'm actually breathing, and that opens space for me, and it opens time up. And so people often feel like there is a the myth is that I have to have more time in which to meditate. I have to have more time for self-care. And I would say, do that first and you will create time, which is part of the text. I mean, it's part of the ancient scriptures, is you do this and then you have more to give, more time, more space. It actually works for our benefit. Yeah. And now I'm understanding that that's probably a brain component, that it's really amazing what the brain does when we're in you know, a state of stress. It's changing the dynamic to our whole being. So, meaning, um, you know, our relationship to time, our relationship to where our thoughts go, and how we're spending so much time, maybe, on this thing when we really are not spending any time in the present moment. Yeah. yeah. So you sort of answered my question that I was going to ask you next, <laughs> was basically about your self-care. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, you've talked about the meditation and some of your yeah. uh, transitions through some of that stuff. Um, what other things do you do for self-care and keep yourself healthy? And what's your wellness philosophy in the oh, program? Oh, I love this. Um, I am a, I, I'm a, I'm a self-care, self-nurturing goddess junkie. I love it. <laughs> and that's one of the things I've prided myself on for most of my adult life, since my mid-20s, so when I was even a young adult. And I've always found self-care and self-nurturing to be the most delicious thing that I could do. And so I came with that, I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was instilled in my childhood, I don't really remember, um, but I know that water, taking baths, and nurturing myself, you know, in a, and it's not, it's in a celebration, it's not really a ritual so much as it's come to this space, enjoy this moment, 
you know, it's very, the things around me matter to me. So I, my home is very soothing. My bathtub is very soothing. Um, I have things around me that, you know, that just offer me soothing, um, offer me peace. And so that's really important for me. My place isn't necessarily clutter cleared, but it's definitely peaceful. And so baths, um, I love delicious, well cooked and organic foods. I love that we have this here in Maine that, you know, our food sources come from local farmers. Um, do I eat some potato chips? Absolutely, yes. I mean, I don't restrict myself because that's part of my self-care. Mm -hmm. Listening to my inner child, if she says she wants a cookie, she might get a cookie. Mm -hmm. I mean, and just really listen to what I need. Um, and I love, um, I love hanging out with people who I appreciate. That's probably part of my joy. And mostly why I do what I do is that that's really part of my self-care is connection. Mm -hmm. Is just to be connected to others. I require a lot of alone time. I need a lot of solitude, but I, but I enjoy my own company. So that's also nourishing and nurturing. Um, and I do every day as part of my self-care, I do um, emotional freedom technique tapping. That's that's something that I probably will never I'll never leave here not doing from now on. That's mm -hmm. pretty important to me. So just some meridians, you know. I come get acupuncture when I need acupuncture, but when I need something just in the moment, I just use the tools that I learned, you know, through these years and meditation, mindfulness, and tapping are yeah. <laughs> great. And um, and love. Oh, I forgot the biggest one. Love. It's <laughs> love. The air of just being alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a tool. So, um, how did you happen to be in this area, and um, what is it that uh, that uh, you enjoy about pursuing this type of work the most? Okay, um, my husband and I um, started um, in the Damariscotta area, and then we moved to Booth Bay, where our son lived, and um, my stepson, who's there, who's now Adam, and he lives in Booth Bay. And then when Adam was graduating from um, high school, and we had our son Wesley, who was, um, there's 16 years between them, Larry had been living, working in Unity, so he'd been traveling all that way, all that distance. So we came to this area and fell in love with Belfast. We were in Northport first, and then we moved to Belfast, and Belfast has this fabulous energy to me, and I'm an energy girl, so I feel this place, I feel like there's a heart and soul that throbs here, and I was hooked. And I love the scenery, and I love the people. And as I was doing a Reiki practice here, and became working with Reiki and working with in the hospice program, I recognized that I needed to be home with my son some more, Wes, our, our son Wesley, who was uh, unschooled, kind of radically unschooled for a bit of time in our in our home. And so I brought the tools and what I was doing home. And as I was Reikiing people there. I recognized that there was grief and loss in everyone that was coming for a Reiki session, which was maybe a physical symptom showing up, but what I was really dealing with on the table were people who were dealing with grief. And so I basically brought my hospice work into my Reiki practice and into my own you know, small area of my home, and that's what shifted everything, was recognizing that pretty much under all of the physical symptomology, symptomology? <laughs> that people were gri maybe grieving and there was a, an emotion that was there that, that Reiki was helping me to serve them, but mostly I was seeing so much sadness and grief that hadn't been acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And so that I brought my meditation that I had learned at Naropa and brought those tools from the Tibetan Buddhists that I had learned, brought them to my Reiki and then brought them to my home. And slowly, and I love this story. Can I tell us a little story? Yes, absolutely. So I had a, a wonderful um, young child. She was, I want to say she was six maybe at the time, maybe six. And she, um, her mom knew that I was doing Reiki and I get a lot of children who like to come. And I have a big child, like a whole bunch of children in me, seems like, that, you know, really love children and children I think we get along really beautifully. So this young child came to my space and she had the worries she called them the worries so she had started school she had the worries she felt incredibly stressed every day and didn't feel well had belly aches had headaches was really suffering 
And so she, her mom asked, could she come? And I said, yes. And so instead of doing Reiki, we sat on the Reiki table like it was a horse. And I asked her just to close her eyes for a few moments because I wanted her to breathe in a new way and to listen to my voice and to guide her into a little mini meditation, which was, I think, about maybe a minute, maybe less. And in that, she opened her eyes afterwards and said, can you bring this to my school? Can we do this at my school and I will, I'll have the bell and you'll do the meditation? And I said, why would you want to do that? Why would you want that? And she listed four things. And today, I, I'm still, I only remember three of them. And it was, I feel very relaxed. She said that. And she said, my worries are gone. And that was the second. And this and was after one minute. One minute. Wow. One minute. That was all it took. Then I, she, I asked her the third thing, and she said, Let's get a little choked up on this one. Um, she said, I believe it will end bullying. And I asked her why she thought that. And she said, my heart feels really good. And, um, and I heard that, and it just hit me that there was no way I was going to abandon this. Mm. Because if a child could say that in just a moment, being in a space, and she got this, and she had a shift, then I, it was my job to do all I could mm. to bring her what she deserved, which mm. was a sense of peace. And um, we had a few more, we had a little more conversation, and I told her that I couldn't bring it right then and there, because I was most likely going to need some background and I was going to need credentials, mm -hmm. but that I promised that I would, in some way, I would bring it to this community. The next morning I woke up, and I turned on my Facebook, which I do after my first tea and my meditation, and I turned on my Facebook at that moment, and the very first thing I saw was a poster of a child sitting on what looked like the mountain in Camden with a long little girl with blonde hair, looked like my friend, and it said, if we taught every eight-year-old to meditate within the span of, I believe it was a decade, all violence would be gone on this planet. Wow. And I nice knew thought, that it? was my confirmation. And it was a Dalai Lama. Mm. It, was a, it was a quote from the Dalai Lama. And I don't quote it properly, but mm. that's what I saw. And that was my confirmation to go. To go. It was wow. my go flag. Mm -hmm. Checkered flag, go. <laughs> and so how were you able to get the credentials and stuff to help you in that process? Okay. Um, I, I don't recall at the moment that I was, I already had the Reiki practice. Mm -hmm. And what I decided to do was just um, bring the information I had from the Tibetan Buddhist, you know, all of the stuff I'd done. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd known a little bit about meditation. And the next thing I knew, I don't know how it happened, but I, I, I had this beautiful dream. <laughs> I tend to get things in my dreams. I had this beautiful dream, and I met this beautiful teacher in a dream. And, and I felt like, I, you know, something would happen. And then I saw somehow, I started to get information on my computer about Deepak Chopra Center. And through the Chopra Center, I started to meditate online. And then I found from, the, from that, it was a 21-day program, Meditate for Free with Oprah and Deepak. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing that. And when I started doing that, I felt like I could bring that to my house. I knew had enough skill to bring that to my house. Mm -hmm. And so I started with a group of women. And they said, we would love to meditate with you. And I said, let's try it. So I put on a class for um, four or five weeks, and you know, I think it was five years ago now. And from that moment on, and the next, then uh, the women are coming to my house, and the next thing I know is uh, something else comes across my computer, and it's David G. And David G. Is, was my teacher. He's from Carlsbad, California, and he is at davidg.com, I believe. And I took his class, but before I took his class, what I found out about him is that he'd been Deepak Chopra's lead educator for 12 years. So he had, you know, been in that place where I was. He was seeking, he found a teacher, and then he went to work for this teacher, and then he went off on his own. And so I contacted him, and I started training with him online classes and then went to Carlsbad to meet a group of people who had been on this online class. We would have webinars 
every um, month for, we did, um, I want to say it was like six or seven months. It, it, was, it was a big chunk of time. It was a big commitment. Yeah, and so like I think I had a nine-month course with it in Europa. It was nine months, and I would go back and forth um, to, um, um, well, it's Denver mm -hmm. area. Uh, but then with David G, it was a number of months, and we, it was very intensive, and it was amazing. And, and I had done that twice now with David G's classes, and I took a master teacher training class with him as well. So when I, but what I've learned over the last couple of years is that that there's the there's already a teacher in me. It's already and uh, there's already a the, you know like the student and the teacher already in me, and it's just the coming trusting myself to come forward and bring that here, and trusting that you know when people come forward that there'll be information and we'll share that information. And I don't um, I don't need to be the best at anything now. I just get to be present and I get to be authentic, and that is what people are looking for. Um, that it's. I, I don't, I, you know, I still, I still swear like a pirate sometimes. I still <laughs> get angry. And that's what people are like, wow, you get angry. I'm like, yes, I'm human, I have a brain. Yes, I'm going to have all these things. But meditation helps me, my practice helps me to shift and recognize right a, more cl closer to mm -hmm. that moment mm -hmm. how to become more mindful so that I give my brain an opportunity to, to breathe and calm down. And then I can make really heart-centered choice and action from that moment versus the knee-jerk knee-jerkery as I've heard it called. Kind of like that word. You, uh, you also, speaking of like transitions and, and going places and what have you, you've recently gone to India as well, haven't you? I did. I did. And how was that for you? Was that transformational? Um, what was your experience there? It's a really, um, I don't still know how to talk about that experience completely. Um, I there were a couple of women who were sitting in my space meditating with me and who have been around the world and one has been to India 25 years ago and she said it, it's likely to take years to integrate India and I get that now, I understand that. Um, the experience for me, I went with a group of about 31 people and David G was the, one of the people who invited me to come. So he said, we're going to do this trip, and there was another yoga with him. She had students, he had students, some of us had never met. There were probably 28 women and three men. I think that's the way it worked out. <laughs> Something, yeah, I think that's right, that's the math. And it was an intense and fast trip. Every place we went, we were only there for a bit of time. It was like 10 days, and we saw a lot in those 10 days. And one of the things that um, was brilliant for, on the teacher's part to me was that we didn't have a lot of time to process. And I thought that was actually brilliant for me because I would have thought myself right out of the process. Mm -hmm. It's a really intense place. And I, it was a difficult trip for me, but not in ways that people thought. When I said it was difficult, there was an energy moving through me. There was, I felt cracked open every day to a source and a sense of love that I've never experienced before, and I love very deeply. I have a family, I have a child, I have a grown child, I have a husband, mom, dogs. <laughs> and so I know how to love, but I had never felt anything quite like this. It was really different, and, and I felt like there was a shine. I kept wanting to, when it was time to go, and one of the things my husband asked is, are you sure you want to go? Are you sure you want to do this? And I said, I have to. I'm going home. I felt like I was going home, and I couldn't say why. And I can't wait to go back. <laughs> um, but what the trip was exactly, I can't actually say yet, other than it was just this reflection constantly, every day, into the eyes of people that wanted to love me in a way that I'd never been loved for. It was hard. I mean, the environment's difficult. I loved it, but it was difficult. My physical body wanted to, you know, gain a lot of fluid and, you know, really, I think it was trying to keep me, you know, present, you know, through my physical body because I could be very like, woo, I was really in the ethers. Uh -huh. um, it's such a spiritual place. It's such a, um, even in the midst of the chaos, I felt a deep sense of calm and peace. And that was probably what I brought back most. Other than uh, Dropping into that, um, if anyone wanted to get in touch with you and, um, get to know you a little bit better or, or work with you in any way, how would they get in touch with you? They can um, find me at uh, my, I have a website that um, Susan Guthrie, Guthrie did for me and I'm so proud of it. Um, it's really just an informational though, it's 
people can go there and then use the address for my email. Okay. And that's at heartcenteredconnection.com. That's great. That's crazy. Great. And, and now <laughs> hopefully beautiful. people here in the uh, area who are able to listen to this broadcast uh, will get to, you know, they've had the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. And if there's folks out there that uh, feel moved to get in touch with you, they'll have that opportunity to, to get some assistance from you. And uh, it's been great to have you on the show.